So I gave a, a title. I'd like to try to talk about a number of different aspects of neuroprediction. You covered very well the kind of future of neuroprediction or predicting future behavior. I'm going to start with a bit of a story about predicting kind of uh, where our lab started and trying to do kind of what we refer to as neuroprediction. So many of you from New York will remember this case. This was um, John Hinckley Jr. And Hinckley is known for um, attempting to assassinate President Ronald Reagan many years ago. And this was the very first time that brain images were used, to my knowledge, the very first time they were used to try to help predict a psychiatric diagnosis. That is, Hinckley defense was saying that he suffered from mental illness like schizophrenia, and the prosecution was saying that no, he didn't, and they were seeking very different outcomes for him. And what was presented was that Hinckley had enlarged ventricles, like you would see in the bottom of the slide. And enlarged ventricles at the time were present in about 45% of all patients who had a diagnosis of schizophrenia. That was kind of epidemiology at the time. And about 4% of people in the normal community had enlarged ventricles. So it was an idea that, that was consistent with this. And you see this a lot in the legal system, if you haven't seen it already, which is that you always often have dueling psychiatrists or someone testifying that they believe this person suffers from this form of mental illness and the other side are, are, are often arguing that no, they don't. When I started in graduate school, <clears throat> I specifically went to work in doing forensic uh, studies, but I also worked with a professor named Peter Little, whose main question as a psychiatrist was, could he predict what illness his patients would have when they presented to the emergency room with psychosis? So do they, if they're hearing voices, hallucinations, delusions, or having these types of symptoms, was there anything neuroscience could do that would help determine what illness they do have then, at that time, rather than waiting to see if they're on some form of a cyclical pattern like would end up with a bipolar disorder or, or a chronic like schizophrenia or some other form of illness? And so, in essence, we were asking this question, which is, can we scan somebody who's in the first episode of this illness and then match them with the different al with algorithms um, to some template. And so in this example, um, it's the same image, so you, even you can do this. You don't need a machine learning algorithm. But we want to know, can we match them to a database of patients with a different illness? And if we can do that, then would that really aid in the prediction of their outcomes or helping to get them better treatment, other types of things, earlier and earlier? And over the, you know, I only have 20 minutes, not my normal hour and a half. So, um, I can't show you all these studies. I can just summarize them for you. So with a number of colleagues, Vince Calhoun in particular, a number of others, we've actually shown over a series of hundreds of papers now that we can get extremely high accuracy for predicting if a patient does have schizophrenia or not, and often as high as 90, 95% accurate. So that's sometimes that's single subject predictive accuracy. So some people are like, well, that's really great. You know? And then the big question becomes, well, how does the legal system consume this if necessary? And we get cases all the time in which attorneys call and ask and they say, I think my client has some form of psychosis, I don't know, or I think they, you know, I really do think they're ill. And there's often just this, this quagmire that you walk through where someone will say that they think they do have an illness and someone doesn't, and the actual implementation of good psychiatric assessment is sometimes a challenge to see proliferate throughout the criminal justice system. And so this test is some, has been used in the past already to help determine if the patient does fit criterion for mental illness. And this is using some functional imaging technology that we've done. The thing that I always like to do, and this is just a tip for everyone, is how do you get neuroscientists to, and engineers to do stuff for free? Do you guys know how to do that? So you have a competition, and you give them only like five grand for whoever wins. And so we did this with this data sets because we want to be able to pass a Fry or Dalbert standard with the data, right? You want to be able to say that it's generally accepted by the scientific community. They get the same answers that we do. And so if you give them the same data, that is the same data that we're using to develop our algorithm, so hopefully high quality data, and you print $10,000 out there, whatever it was, to get them to do this. What happened was um, we had over 370 teams apply. And you can see here, and I think that'll show up for you, that the vast majority you know, had a over 80% sensitivity specificity for classifying with multimodal data whether or not a patient had schizophrenia or not. And of course, then you get goofballs down here who are less than chance. You wonder why they even submitted that. You know? But on average, on average, what was really exciting was that the majority of the community was getting this really, really, really high degree of accuracy. And, then, and they're all using different algorithms. To, I mean, everyone has different machine learning algorithms or deep learning algorithms, other types of things they do to, to parse the data, to do things with it. And so that really kind of convinced me that, that this is something that is, should be generally accepted. In fact, this is like five years ago already um, that this was done. And so this is an example of trying to use imaging to try to predict a psychiatric illness. And you know, I'll be honest with you, if you have a good psychiatrist, that's all it really takes to know if someone is psychotic or not. But nevertheless, 
Apparently that's not always easy to find in the community and lawyers are always wanting to challenge it. So neuroscience in this context I think can be helpful for making this, this is a post-dictive prediction, right? This is predicting what illness you have. But of course the type of illness that you have can be predictive of your future behavior. And so the story I'd like to tell is then, well, what if this is your client, right? You all know how this goes. You all see Hannibal in this picture, not Anthony Hopkins. But what's, you know, what's wrong and what's going on with Hannibal? Well, one of the things that people often talk about is that Hannibal may have these traits. These things that we refer to as psychopathic traits are, these are the items that are on my advisor's checklist called the Harris Psychopathy Checklist. And there's 20 items. And I know you're thinking about your roommate right now or your boss or your professor or whoever else is in the room. But these traits have to be present at home, at work, at school, with family and friends. They have to be present in all these different domains for the majority of your life. It's not like they just magically appear when you hit puberty or something. So they're, they really are present for a long period of time. I'm not going to go through a lot of them, just kind of highlight. You know, these individuals who have these traits at high levels, they're really different than everybody else. It's one of the classic things that you read when you read old clinical textbooks about psychiatrists or psychologists who are interviewing these individuals. They're just like, they're just so different. And it's true. When you actually meet someone who scores in the top of distribution of these traits, they really are fundamentally different than the rest of us. They really present as different as any psychiatric group I've ever studied. And they really have an inability to appreciate how their behavior impacts other people. So they suffer from a lack of empathy, guilt, and remorse. And so when you meet somebody like this, who's been like this for a long period of time, and they've been carefully assessed on these traits, because it takes four to six hours to assess and interview and follow through with this, it turns out that what's really interesting, criminal or forensically, is that these traits predict future behavior. And so here's one of the longest outcome studies that was ever looked at. So they, they scored all in a whole bunch of, I think there's over 400 in this group. And this is Canadian data, by the way. So these are called survival curves, for those of you not familiar with looking at these graphs. So basically what it shows in green, or in red, we'll start with the red line, is that we release all of these individuals who were previously convicted of a violent crime into the Canadian community, and we follow them up over a period of 25 years. And what you can see is that about 50% of those in the, green, in the red line, those that scored low on psychopathy when they were released, have about a 50% chance of being reconvicted of a new violent crime. But then when you look at the green line, you're like, wow, well, I mean, it's pretty impressive, right? All of a sudden you get down to here, like seven years out, and over 70% of the sample of those that score high on these traits have already been convicted of a new violent crime and are back in prison. And that's impressive because, you know, then when you get down here, oops, when you get down here to up to 90, 95%, I mean, that's near certain prediction. In fact, I always joke about this because I'm married to a Canadian, but also I'm like, well, what happens with the last of these samples? Well, there's two things. One, they might be deceased, or two, they're in the US. <laughs> <coughs> so the point is, like, the relationship between psychopathy and violent crime is like 0 0.35, 0 0.39. To kind of, for all of us in the, in the room who are getting a little older, the relationship between chest pain and having a heart attack is 0.15. So just to kind of ground you about the level of predictive accuracy that this test has, it's extremely predictive. In fact, many countries have adopted it at mandate to be part of all risk assessments that they use. Now, implementing it and getting it done well, that's a different story, because um, it can be manipulated just like any other test can. And it turns out that it can predict as early as age. This is work from Gina Vincent, who's in, from up in Massachusetts. Um, and so she's followed a whole bunch of high-risk kids who were all convicted of violent crimes by the uh, range 14, 15 years old, and they follow them up. And what you can see is within several years of being released from prison, these traits, even in adolescence, are showing a very similar predictive utility, a rough doubling of risk in kids that scored high in these traits institutionally when they were assessed versus um, following them up. And so this has big implications. And um, most of the risk assessments that are the best peer-reviewed, peer-vetted risk assessments include measurement of psychopathy in, this, in these contexts. But how do we study Hannibal? I mean, how do we apply neuroscience to study Hannibal? Well, you remember what happened when they transported him? So not going to happen, right? In fact, when I moved from Canada to the US, we started applying for getting options on how we would go about scanning inmates and doing this kind of stuff. And basically, eight corrections departments across the country all said, no, there's no chance that we're going to bring inmates out for research purposes for maximum security to your hospital to scan them. OK, well then, New Mexico came up with a different solution when I was recruited there. And, and we thought, well, let's do this. And so we built a trailer. I know I live in New Mexico in a trailer, but it's a very nice trailer. <laughs> And in this trailer, we've actually been able to, as you already commented, scan thousands of inmates. Um, over 4,000 inmates have participated in studies right now. 
And these include uh, inmates from both New Mexico and Wisconsin. For whatever reasons, we've had colleagues, including Ariel, who worked and had research labs in Wisconsin and been working with them for many years. And so we pretty much studied everything. So in the next five minutes, I'm going to tell you, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to tell you about all of this data. I'm going to highlight for you just a handful of studies that we've done looking and asking questions about prediction. So we can get into, and just summary slide here, so what is happening in the brain with individuals with psychopathic traits? So you can all be pattern classifiers right now and look at these maps and see the areas that are blue. These are areas that are having weaker gray matter or less muscle mass, if you will, and less thinking power. And you're going to notice the orbital frontal cortex, anterior cingulate cortex, those that know your structures, uh, medial temporal lobes, including the anterior temporal pole and amygdala, are all showing somewhere between 4 to 10 percent less gray matter. And of course, that was in adult males. This is about 300 men in that study. We've also published papers in adolescent boys who are in maximum security, showing that these callous and emotional traits, just like they predict future outcomes or future behaviors, we're also seeing that they're showing the same structural differences as their counterparts in adult. And then we've also published one paper in adolescent girls. And since we're being videotaped, I'm only showing you published data. Um, also showing that even girls, psychopathy doesn't tend to discriminate across sex. So we're seeing the same structural uh, findings in individuals here. And again, this is just showing the relationship between callous and emotional traits or psychopathic traits in adults and gray matter reductions. And this is about 1,000 subjects on this slide that we're showing you here. And so we have applied in a competition, actually. They got us to do it, too. Um, uh, classifiers, so machine learning classifiers. Can it learn from this data? Can it cross-validate and then actually predict group membership? And when we do that, in the youth, we were getting about 80 85% accurate. So the kids that have committed these, tra uh, committed these offenses, or significant felony offenses, who are in the top end of the distribution compared to all of their peers in maximum security that score in these traits, they're, they're very different. Their behavior is different, and they're, then they're, thus their brains are different. And so we also know now that that predicts. So the it, natural question is, well, then do these structural brain regions predict future outcomes? Does the brain data predict as well as the clinical data? So that was a natural extension of this type of post-dictive work, trying to determine if we could help to understand this. We've also published some neat studies showing that, that kids that commit homicide have different brain structure, even more so than this, than kids in the facilities that haven't committed homicide. And there's a long history that goes on with along those types of things. So, um, so there are, there it goes, a lot of different variables that people have identified um, that predict future antisocial behavior. Okay. Age is one of the great ones. We'll get to that in a minute. Genetics is another one. And someone needs to get a clock on me to make sure I don't talk too long because I want to give my, oh, 13 minutes. Good. So everyone always asks me about genetics. I'm like, really? Crime's genetic? I'm like, absolutely. It's genetic. You know, 90% of individuals in prison have this genetic abnormality. 99% of individuals on death row have this abnormality. It's called the Y chromosome. <laughs> Men are the ones that commit the vast majority of crime and violence in society. I have four sisters, so they're always happy to hear that. Um, and people always say, like, I'm like, of course it's genetic. I mean, if I, that's 90% prediction. That's fantastic prediction. You guys should go home. If we can predict that well, I mean, we're done, right? That's amazing prediction. Other types of variables predict, like if you've committed a crime very early, like 8, 9, or 10 years old versus 12, 13, 14, kind of early adolescent onset, so Tammy Moffat and other people have started to show all these kinds of things. The type of index, or if you committed a crime and you have mental illness, that exacerbates and becomes a new risk factor. We all know not to drink or do alcohol or drugs. That causes problems, too. Employment, social support, those are positive predictors. You give someone an inmate good employment when they get out or give them, you know, if they develop from using what's called multisystemic therapy, really kind of solve the family problems or the family dynamics before they get released, that's a protective factor. They're less likely to reoffend. And then we have psychopathy score. That's PCLR. That's predicting. But impulsivity predicts. And so... We can measure impulsivity many different ways. I could have given you guys all a questionnaire to have you fill that out before you come in, and I could just have a distribution of how you score on traits related to measuring impulsivity. I could put you in a neuropsych test in a chamber and have you fill out do a bunch of games and see how many errors you make or other types of measures to try to measure some form of impulsivity. I could interview all of your spouses or significant others or parents and get kind of a lifetime history of your impulsivity and how you've acted and done stuff, et cetera. I'm guessing this group is pretty low on impulsivity. And I can also scan your brain. And of course, everyone's invited to New Mexico if you want to get a scan of your brain. I mean, I can do that for you, no problem. 
we have our own trailer with a scanner in it. So <laughs> the point is, is that um, if I was to scan your brain while you're doing a task that measures impulsivity, that all neuroscientists agree is measuring impulsivity, it's called a go-no-go -no -go task, and we can quantify and measure while you're doing this task the circuits that are engaged while you're trying to do an inhibitory stimulus, processing it, right? We have beautiful maps of the brain. It's very robust. We've published that we get 90, 95% of people activating the same regions of the brain. We can do it in as few as five or six trials. So we published all these types of methods papers. So then the question became, and we had a sample that the MacArthur Foundation paid to allow us to follow them up. So we actually were able to get real data, follow-up data on this 100 subjects so that we could try to see if all those other variables predicted, but also does the neuroimaging data predict whether or not they're going to reoffend or not. And this is one of those things, you know, you one of these ideas that you have, and then you have the benefit of having some good postdocs, and so you, you tell your postdoc, you know, I, I all, would you mind doing this analysis for me? Here's the prediction, here's the region I want you to use exactly from this previous paper, go do this. And he says, well, it's not going to work. I'm like, well, I love it when postdocs say that, because my retort is, well, it's a stake bet then. Mm -hmm. It's a stake, you buy or I buy. If it doesn't work, I buy. If I do, buy, you buy. And I don't care if they make 40 grand a year, I don't care, I'm, buy, I'm making them take me to a nice steakhouse. <laughs> And they know that. And so he comes back and he's like, you're not going to believe this. He's like, it predicts. In fact, it's hugely predictive. Odds ratio of four and a half. So it's another survival curve. And after controlling for variables like age at release and time at release and drug problems, anxiety measures, false alarm behavioral measures, psychopathy scores, after all that's been covaried or measured, cingulate activity, anterior activity within the anterior cingulate was hugely predictive. So these are the guys right, that had high cingulate activity. Okay? What does that mean? People who have high single activity get all the way to the point of like obsessive compulsive thoughts, right? It's off the charts if you, you know, if you, um, if you look at exaggerated cingulate activity. Um, and we've published papers with this task on patients with OCD and even hoarding, hoarding behaviors. Um, but these are men that on average, relative to the rest of the peers, have a median split. They have high levels of activity. And it basically means they worry a little bit more than the rest, I think. That is, they stop and they think and they ruminate a little bit more than others. And that has helped them protect from acting out or because th they thought about it for a while. Rumination. And then the other group who had low activity in the cingulate while they did this task, but the similar behavior and everything else, I mean, an odds ratio of four and a half. So here you have 60% of them have been convicted of a new crime, as any crime. Um, and that's impressive. And so this was the first demonstration that neuroscience data prospectively predicted future antisocial behavior in a forensic population. And then we went on and we thought, well, what about age? So everybody can think back to when you were like 17, 18 years old. And would your friends, when you were, let's say, 18 years old, classify you as emotionally mature or emotionally mature? Walter and I would have been emotionally, prob well, Walter's probably more mature than I was. I probably, my friends would have said I was emotionally immature. But I'm still, Walter and I have the same, Walter's one of the next speakers coming up. Sorry, he hasn't been introduced yet, but um, you'll, you'll get the picture after he talks. So the point is, is that we all have friends and there's a distribution. So we all have the age of 18, but some of us are more mature than others and some of us are less mature. More likely that that 18 might convey some risk. Well, in prediction, age is the single biggest variable that predicts reoffending. When you're 15 to 18 years old, that's the maximum risk for you to commit antisocial behavior. Okay? And then you slowly age out of it, on average. Okay? And so most risk assessment instruments, it's a rough doubling or even tripling of risk between 20 to 40 years old. And so if they can just get you older, you're less likely to reoffend. But we were interested in knowing if age is a good variable to include in there or is there a better way. So one of the things that's taking over neuroscience right now, in fact, there's just a brand new competition to predict brain age, is to compute your age like those of us that have kids, you've got your kid on your growth curve. Doctor says, though, they're here, here, or there. You know, my kids happen to have big heads, so they're like a 90th percentile of head size, but like 60th, I know, they're little wobble, weeble wobbles. They got big heads and they got little bodies, right? <laughs> and so they're like 50th percentile for that. And then I'm like, well, what's the norm? Well, you know, what's the, tell me about the, where, where'd you get these norms from? Most physicians have no idea where they got that data from. I'm like, that's okay. But so what we did, is we took 1,150 or so inmates and we threw their brains into an algorithm that parses it naturally, kind of carves things at the joints called independent component analysis. And then from that, we asked with the machine learning algorithm, can we predict age? So which of the 30 or so brain components 
are predictive of age. So we trained the system, and then we tested the system, and then we tried to predict it in the same sample that we had from uh, the previous paper. And you, as you can see, this is the type of thing you like to publish when you have these just perfect predictive algorithms. So it turns out that your brain, we can really accurately predict your age using structural-based data from an MRI. Sorry if I forgot to mention that. But then what I was interested in is like, which components of the brain predict reoffending? And moreover, do they predict better than does chronological age? So can I measure where, and then which circuits there too? So what we found is that these are the two circuits, these parts of the um, orbital frontal and anterior temporal lobe, that when we included them in the algorithm, the values for them, if you were more immature on these values, meaning that you kind of had a less developed circuitry in these regions, you were more likely to reoffend than your peers with the same age. And that these two algorithms, or these two components in the algorithm, actually showed that we were able to better predict your outcomes with these measures than with your chronological age. So as you might expect, neuroscience is getting exquisitely good at measuring, and we've always been good at measuring, but now we're better at decomposing the information in such a way to find that it has predictive utility. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and, and stop there and thank all the different people that I send to prison. And, um, and do work. And I wrote a book that talks about a lot of these types of things. And since the publishers down the street might be here, I had to make sure I plugged my own book. Um, and so I, I, don't, I can take questions, but I'm going to switch now. Are you going to come introduce the next? Yeah. So she's right there, so no questions. And so, um, but we are doing the laptop shuffle. So who do I switch? Can I help switch it back? Oh. Sorry, there's someone been paid to do this. So I will let them go ahead and switch, and I will get out of the way. And we're supposed to wait for questions. So thank you very much for your attention.